What's up YouTube? My name's Adam and I'm the Boston Bookhead. Today we're going to be talking about Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Freaking great book. Let's get into it. So this book has me thinking a lot about what we're capable of as human beings. Murder, stealing, lying, killing one person for the benefit of a hundred others, light stuff like that all packed into this novel and Dostoevsky goes really psychological with all of it. It was Dostoevsky's second novel published after his 10 years in Siberia and for those of you who have not read this it follows the story of Rojin Romanovich Raskolnikov who is an ex-student living in St. Petersburg and so he gets this crazy idea to go murder uh, the local pawnbroker who's stingy, mean, everyone hates her, and you know, with the funds that he can get from that, from, you know, looting her, he can support his family, save his sister from getting to a marriage she doesn't want to get into, uh, he can pay for his school, and then ultimately go and help the greater population. The twist is, you guessed it, he's struck with guilt after an anguish, he can't do anything, and it's just, and he's, you know, he becomes his own downfall. You know, regular Wednesday, here we go. Okay, so some of the theories. One of the big theories in this book is killing one person for the sake of benefiting a hundred more, or, you know, the greater population in general. So Raskolnikov first gets this idea to kill the pawnbroker by actually overhearing another student in a tavern. The student says, kill her, take her money, and with the help of it, devote oneself to the service of humanity and the good of all. What do you think? Would not one tiny crime be wiped out by thousands of good deeds? One death and a hundred lives in exchange. It's simple arithmetic. That's the math I like. All right, let's keep going. A little bit later in the novel, we get introduced to Porfiry Petrovich, who is the big bad Sherlock Holmes. He's the investigator after the murder of the pawnbroker. So Porfiry, when, you know, conveniently finds an article that Raskolnikov wrote and was published in the periodical review, Raskolnikov had no idea it was published. This turns out to be very bad for Raskolnikov because he pretty much gives away his entire symptoms and plot and you know how he would act during a murder but let's dive a little bit more into his philosophy behind the extraordinary man so the first point he makes is that he outlines that all perpetrations of crime are followed by an illness before during and after it seems that Raskolnikov is plagued by either mental and then you know after physical illness where he faints in the police office his family and friends don't see him for days and then when they do he's walking around like a ghost all Sick like ugh. The second is that all men are divided into ordinary and extraordinary men. Ordinary men are people that can only reproduce their own kind, and extraordinary men are people who have the gift to utter a new word. The third is that ordinary men have to live in submission because they have no right to transgress the law because they are ordinary. The fourth is that in contrast, extraordinary men have every right to transgress the law. Extraordinary people have the right to decide if their inner conscience will allow them to overstep the bounds of the laws in order to obtain or create something extraordinary. The fifth is that Raskolnikov argues that any extraordinary man has the right to kill other men in order to achieve his goals. In this instance, he brings up Muhammad and Napoleon and even says that Newton had the right to kill 100 men in order to present his knowledge to the world. And the sixth is that all great men must not submit to common law because if they do, then they're not extraordinary. As I said, the speech is very allegorical, um, pretty much hits beat for beat what Raskolnikov was going through, went through before and after he killed the pawnbroker. And Raskolnikov, on like ordinary men has no new word to bring to the table. His murder didn't benefit anyone. In fact, he took the money, hid it under a rock, and ran. So this new word, or Raskolnikov's arguments for justifying crime, is that all great men, or even men a little out of the common, that is to say, capable of giving some new word, must from their very nature be criminals. So that's falling in line a little bit more with what us sane people might be thinking about the situation. I think, well, I know, Raskolnikov really wanted to just be a Napoleon. He wanted to be a Muhammad. He wanted to be a Newton. He wanted his life to not just be validated, but to have significance behind it. And so he's going through and racing through his mind and trying to peg up as to why he is the next great thing, where in reality, like I said, his murder brought absolutely nothing to the table. Additionally, I think a satirization of this word will help drive the nail in a little bit more. <coughs> In Crime and Punishment, when Dostoevsky uses the word extraordinary, it's often followed with a drowsy, negative connotation, other words around it. You know, okay, so let me just give you a few examples. On page 52, dreams are described as having a singular actuality, vividness, and extraordinary semblance of reality. On page 66, 
and his drowsiness and stupefaction were followed by an extraordinary, feverish, as it were, distracted haste. And on page 152, extraordinary is used to describe Raskolnikov's state after a transformation took place. Raskolnikov set an earnest face was suddenly transformed, and in one flash he recalled with extraordinary vividness of sensation a moment in this recent past. So in other words, if you think you're extraordinary, you're probably drowsy, deluded, or just plain stupid. But now we have this bigger question. If the end is noble, is the means always justified? I wrote this one down because I was thinking hard about this one. All right, ready? Okay. So typical contradiction in the book is that Raskolnikov will at one time maintain that the murder was committed to benefit mankind, but then he will argue that the extraordinary man must be above mankind and not be concerned with what mankind will think of him. Such an incomplete understanding of his own thoughts and such contradictory statements are the rationale that leads Raskolnikov to the possibility of redemption. All that being said, let's discuss ordinary, extraordinary people today. So I don't think this theory, you know, like any other binary theory holds true. But if we went through with it and we wanted to pick out who might be extraordinary, it would probably be world leaders who could be considered war criminals. You know, it's kind of like Napoleon. Uh, everyone hates him, is, you know, calling for his death. But, you know, 10, 20 years later, they're all thinking, oh, wow, what, like, you know, he's the greatest conqueror ever. And, you know, even still, he's one of the greatest conquerors ever. So who do we have in today's society that's kind of like that? I mean, it's going to be our presidents in the U.S., uh, prime ministers, U.K., wherever you are, whatever world leaders there are, those are the extraordinary men and women that make up this world. So thank you so much for watching, guys. This is a new channel. First video, um, hit like and subscribe. That's the routine. Share it with your friends. Kind of just getting a hang for all this. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>